good evening good morning good day to one and all again i welcome you all on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science with another interesting lecture series and the topic is very interesting the use of 3d printing in humanitarian forensics we welcome matthew a forensic advisor for data and the international committee for the red cross icrc geneva thank you matthew for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk on the topic the use of 3d printing in humanitarian forensic which is very very important i welcome you on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science along with my co-host dr pooja chakravarti i request dr pooja chakravarti to welcome our esteemed speaker and give the introduction about our today's speaker dr pooja over to you Hello, sir. To introduce our speaker for the day, he is a forensic anthropologist and archaeologist with background and experience primarily for human identification, missing persons, human rights, and humanitarian forensics. Prior to the ICRC, he had worked in the U.S., Western Balkans, and Iraq for several governmental and non-governmental organizations for the search, recovery, and identification of human remains. For the last seven years, he has been working for the International Committee of Red Cross as a forensic coordinator or advisor in the Western Balkans, South Caucasus, Central Asia, and North Africa. He is now based in ICRC headquarters in Geneva. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Uh, I welcome Matthew once again and uh, request our esteemed speaker Matthew to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, just to just to uh, give a, just a general introduction, also to my background, is that uh, as as already presented from Dr. Pooja, it's more of a forensic background, uh, and that my experience in three D printing is relatively new in the last three years. And this kind of um, it's it's a new generally a new technology. So I'm not an engineer or expert in uh, in necessarily three D printing and engineering. Just wanted to go over that. Okay, and uh, later I think we'll have time for questions at each session because I'll be going through some things that some people might not be familiar with, uh, uh, such as not just three D printing but also humanitarian forensics, which is a relatively uh, uh, uncommon field or not commonly known to most people and how it differs from other type of uh, forensic, uh, the fields of forensics. So uh, we'll, we'll have time for questions about that if somebody has anything. So, but I'll just start the presentation off uh, now. Let's see if I can share. Okay. So I'll begin just the presentation with a qu very qu uh, quick uh, overview of 3D printing uh, in general terms, so that many of you probably have already heard of it. It's uh, it's an added it's a it's a process of additive manufacturing of three dimensional objects from digital file, uh, in which uh, the machine uh, can lay down successive layers of materials until the 3D object is, uh, is created using uh, uh, thinly sliced sections. It uh, allows production of complex shapes. Uh, it's most often, people will often see it in plastic. However, uh, it's commonly used in engineering, in metal or other materials. And uh, probably many of you have seen in the news that there's uh, testing in 3D printing uh, human cells like stem cells for human tissue. Uh, originally, uh, 3D printing was used in engineering or industrial prototyping. It can be very, it was very costly, and uh, where machines and equipment would be tens or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. However, in recent years, uh, it's become much more accessible, uh, mainly due to the open source uh, community, uh, because after a certain time, uh, the technology became more uh, commonly available in, in the open source uh, community. It became also very low cost 
And uh, it still, it maintains a high consistency and quality. So you can kind of really reproduce uh, the same thing over and over again without too much error. And uh, many of you, as I said, probably have already heard, it's more commonly used in, uh, not just at home, but it's being used in medicine, dentistry, archeology span or heritage museums and local consumers. So a lot of it's quite Now, uh, now we're getting approaching the holiday season where it's uh, selves to, uh, to buy at home to, to use. Uh, so every year it's, it's kind of gotten much more uh, common. It's gotten uh, cheaper, it's, the quality has increased and there's a much more, much more variety in it. And for today's uh, session, uh, there are a bunch of other types of 3D printing uh, as I mentioned before, not just plastic, and, but and also even in plastic, there's different ways to do it in which uh, you can use um, different things like powder and uh, where a powder is laid down and lasers can center a powder into a plastic. Or there's also uh, another types of 3D printing in which uses a, a resin, a liquid resin in which uh, uh, light, usually lasers or a, a light will uh, harden the plastic. Uh, today, I will be sticking with the most common one, which is the FDM, uh, which is called fused deposition modeling, uh, which is in, in the diagram on the bottom right, you can see an example where a piece of plastic filament is sent through uh, an extruder. Uh, basically, it's a machine that has little gears that will pull the plastic in at a very precise uh, uh, time in which it will do a certain precise distance and it will move in an extremely precise location on a horizontal axis. And as it goes down onto the, the bed or the platform, it slowly layer, layers it down in this plastic. Uh, each, each layer can be approximately 50 microns to 100 microns or 200 microns on what's called this uh, fused deposition with a plastic filament, which is in a uh, plastic spool, which uh, I can just have show an example. An example of a piece of plastic spool, which just comes on, on a cylinder and it looks kind of like uh, this material, just very thin plastic. And so as it comes down, it's uh, after it's heated to a certain temperature, it creates the object in 3D, often sometimes creating a support structure, which you can see on the bottom of this uh, mock-up where some pieces of plastic to hold it up to, uh, to maintain, maintain the object. So this is, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of staying with the most commonly, uh, commonly used. These are uh, quite inexpensive, these uh, 3D printers compared to five or 10 years ago, and the quality has really uh, increased. Uh, the costs are even less than $300. You can, you can get a 3D printer that this type of FDM. The plastic, the material is quite inexpensive as well. For one kilogram, uh, it's, it, you can get between 20 and $50 per kilogram. The software to prepare it or to slice so that the, the 3D printer knows which direction to go to and how to extrude it uh, is also very, uh, very inexpensive. Uh, most of them are actually free. And the maintenance of the machine also too is quite inexpensive. So overall, we, in the last uh, say 10 years, we have machines now that would have cost uh, many, many thousands of dollars, uh, which was and was limited to an industrial uh, or engineering prototyping to very only a few hundred dollars of a machine. Also time, uh, also what is the time is actually much uh, faster to make. So you can actually really create an object in a faster time and also what's called the preparation or po what's called post-processing time. And this is where after the object is printed, you have to uh, remove some support structures, usually with some small tools. It doesn't take too, take too lot of time. Uh, 
And it's quite simple. It's just use it with your hands or small tools. It's also uh, much safer than other types of 3D printing. Uh, some of the other printing that I mentioned before, like using a liquid resin, a resin plastic, uh, can be quite toxic. Uh, and as well as the powder materials, whether it's for plastic or metal, uh, also require uh, additional ventilation or, or a hood structure. Uh, however, most uh, consumer uh, consumer grade uh, 3D printers, you can place on your desk uh, and it's uh, the plastic is uh, biodegradable as well. It's uh, more of a safer plastic. There's a bit of different varieties of plastic as well. Uh, for me, I'll be today's presentation, I'll stick with a more generic, what's called polylactic acid, uh, PLA plastic, which is this mostly biodegradable. And it's quite commonly available uh, in 3D printing now. In, uh, it's uh, five years ago, you would only see it maybe in uh, dentistry and uh, some very few hospitals might have it to make uh, objects for, from based on a CT scan or for surgery preparation. And, and as I said, dentistry, but in the last five years, really seen explosion in uh, research studies and the applications in, in uh, it's becoming more and more common not only more commonly available, but the technical support and the learning is, is getting a bit, uh, is really in, uh, getting better. Uh, like I said, my, myself, I, I uh, started doing this about three years ago, uh, and which I'll go into a little bit later on. The reason why I started doing it three years ago was, was finding a, uh, how that some new technologies can be incorporated into my work or colleagues work to, to really help the work that they do. So that's more of the general aspect of the 3D printing. And then in, when it goes to say in forensic science or what I'll uh, go into uh, some examples is in forensic science or even anatomy. So we're, at, we're talking at the level of anatomical objects. We're talking uh, primarily about bones in, in this today's presentation about skeletal material, which is a bit easier to, uh, to 3D print. Uh, however, other organs such as uh, brain or heart, liver, other uh, organs can be 3D printed in a, of course, as a plastic material. But my background in forensic anthropology and archaeology, uh, I'm more interested in uh, replicating skeletal elements. So in 3D printing, you these forensic objects and body parts, uh, we have two, two main ways to, to create uh, the object. Is one is by using CT scans uh, in which uh, the body or body part uh, undergo scanning at a CT scanner and the files are created in the thin slices, approximately 100 to 200 microns. This is about uh, 100 microns is about as thin as a human hair or a piece of paper, just to give you an example. So when someone is, is undergoing a CT scan, it scans a slice of the body approximately 100 to 200, sometimes 300, and it will maybe even skip. So it'll do a slice, then it'll go over 300 to 300 microns, and then do another slice, and then another slice. And uh, so using these type of scans, uh, there's software available, also free or inexpensive software to merge all those scan files uh, based on the type of object at different density as well. So that's, that's the very quick way, but very often people don't have CT scanners. It's very, very, very expensive. It's uh, more commonly uh, found in, of course, in, in uh, uh, hospitals and universities, but it's a quite, uh, for any of you that had a CT scan, no, it's not something you can just put in your lab. However, there is other type of scanning, which is called surface scanning with uh, light or lasers. Even uh, what's called photogrammetry, uh, which is another technology I'll just touch upon, which is where you just take a lot of images from a digital camera, even your phone, in which uh, the software will stitch the images together from different angles. So you, it's, it's kind of like you're scanning an object with your uh, either a camera, a phone, or having a special device. If you can see here on the, in the presentation on the left side, uh, someone is using a special 
laser scanner, which has a bit more higher precision, to create the digital model in 3D. So once the model is scanned, it's uh, it's saved as a as a .obj or .stl, these different types of files, which is just a 3D file. And this model can then be cleaned because there might be like gaps or holes in the object to uh, better, uh, to make sure that it is a solid object in 3D, make sure that there's no holes in it. Kind of to make sure that it's a watertight. Imagine that if the object has to go completely around, that there's no holes going into the object. Of course, if there's natural holes, that's quite fine. But in 3D, it just has to be a cleaned, uh, what's called like a watertight file. And then once the object is in 3D, it can be uh, sent through another software program uh, for slicing or 3D printing, in which you configure the software to, to what type of printer that you're using, uh, as well as the the specification of what type of plastic that you're using as well, because for each of these, you can use different types of plastic, more of a denser heat resistant plastic. Uh, also, you can change the resolution as well. Do you want this model as it's lit, um, creating each layer? Do you want something very, very precise, which can be each layer can be about 50 to 100 microns, each layer of the plastic? Or do you want something more quicker that can go to two or 300 microns as it's doing later or something less precise, but it's much faster. So that's one way of, of, of doing the process uh, that I went extremely quick on. Uh, just to touch upon, um, a lot of people have questions is, well, what if I don't have a surface scanner, uh, don't have the objects and I don't have a CT scanner, is that many, Many models, uh, when I'm talking about these anatomy models in particularly, are uh, very now very, very commonly available in online repositories. Uh, museums, universities, nonprofit organizations uh, provide them uh, primarily for free. There are some places that do, uh, do have it paid in which the, the people that do the scanning uh, can be compensated. However, the vast majority are, are used for educational purposes. Uh, so that there are, people can can request either through a request process to obtain uh, high quality models. And these models were done through a very thorough process of scanning either by laser scanning, which I mentioned before, or CT scans. So we have very high quality. And even in itself, I could do another presentation just on the 3D models that are now available online in which now uh, people can look at 3D models to understand the anatomy. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm going back to my, my example of myself as a forensic anthropologist in which uh, we had, I've had a lot of prob programs in which we train uh, students on human anatomy and bones, where part of the process of understanding the, the bones is understanding, are they human? Are they male or female? Are they adult or child? Is this, uh, is this bone from a left hand or right hand? Do we have the bones of, of uh, five persons or the bone from one person? Is it fragmentary? What kind of disease did the person have? Did they sustain injuries? Uh, something either at the cause of death are there identifying features. So in the field and going back to my background is more in forensic anthropology. When I was back in school, it was we're, we're using uh, just pictures in a book. We're using a uh, skeletal collection in, uh, that's on hand. We'd have to use an archeological, usually an archeological collection in which I have uh, bones that are from the, from the university or museum to actually handle or touch. This goes into, you can see pictures of, uh, of the anatomy, but until you hold it in your hands or you can, see it in 3D, it's going to be very difficult to, un, to really to learn. Uh, and 3D modeling and 3D printed objects uh, can really, really enhance this when you do not have a very large collection uh, in, in person, where in your office you do not have a collection of 100 skeletons, or you don't, some very, very common now, 
that uh, when I see in many countries now uh, that don't have one uh, human body collection, they don't have uh, because either legal restrictions or that it's not that common that people is forensic anthropology is not very common in many countries. So going back to the 3D printing that the objects that you can create now, it's, it's now it, going back, uh, I had started this three years ago and what I, I wanted to see is how complex and accurate the models that can be 3D printed. So what is the, initially I, I had thought that, okay, well, people use them to create toys or to create um, engineering uh, brackets or objects that are more uh, not organic. I did not think that it was, a, you could do organic, but obviously you can make very organic, lifelike or natural, uh, in a natural uh, looking objects that, can be, and they're also extremely accurate. The precision of the accuracy is, is very, 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 it's quite measurable on the, to see that from the original model to the scan model and the 3D printed object uh, is quite accurate. And these uh, models that are printed out can be used uh, for in presentation purposes. And uh, for example, it's uh, in some, Few cases is being used in the courtroom, uh, so that uh, a replica of, uh, say, an um, injury injured uh, bone can be presented in the court rather than uh, images which are 2D, which don't convey uh, the full picture, uh, as well as in other aspects where uh, during the examination of human remains, uh, it's it's still uh, used today where people take a physical skull of a uh, person who's unidentified, a skull, a decomposed, the person is usually uh, is decomposed and the authorities are trying to see who this person can be. And in these cases, they do a facial reconstruction in which they will layer down clay to, to do an, either an artistic or a medical reconstruction of the face to try to identify the person. And having a uh, 3D printed skull allows uh, the forensic specialist to either to not use the real skull because that real skull is human remains that uh, might not be able to be taken to the forensic artist to do the reconstruction or also to, because once you do put these uh, forensic uh, facial reconstruction, it's covered in the clay. Uh, and then, then you have to remove it from the clay and then send it back with the human remains. So it's another way that it's can also being used at this level. Uh, for analysis of fractured and fragmentary remains. So if when you have many fragmentary remains, now a lot of research is being done on quickly scanning fragmentary remains. You have it in 3D and then these can be also 3D printed to have kind of a fit to see how they, how they, how they uh, can be done with, with the 3D printed or in digital form. Uh, pathology, visualization of pathology or disease as well. Uh, and of course in custom prosthetics. So these are just a bit of a few. Custom prosthetics is not really forensics, but this will come up. I, I, this is uh, quite common also with uh, a lot of institutions that they can see for prosthetics when I'm thinking I am saying more of an artificial uh, limb as an external, not necessarily an implant. So there is in, in medicine use of uh, medical grade uh, implants, not necessarily prosthetics. So before I go into the more humanitarian forensic, I just wanted to, I just gave a very brief overview in about 10 minutes in, in 3D printing. Uh, do we have any, any questions at this time about uh, 3D printing and more in the scope of 3D printing anatomy objects? Anyone have any question, Dr. Pooja? Yeah, uh, uh, Matthew, uh, 3D printing, if you are using in this, making a replica of bullets or uh, gun, how it will be uh, good apart from the humanitarian, if you are making a 3D printed gun or will it work? Uh, <laughs> way? 
Yeah, no, that, that it's actually is a comment that some uh, colleagues uh, came up to me about because this is one of the very common thing, uh, common in the news media is about 3D printed guns, uh, as in people apparently that people can use 3D printing as well as any other engineering to create parts uh, of uh, mechanical parts for uh, things like guns as well. I've never uh, 3D printed a gun. Uh, uh, it's it's I. And what I've read and heard, and, and but I've never seen is that people usually 3D print the parts for either attachments of a gun, but I've uh, heard like many of you that they people do a functioning gun out of 3D printing, just as people can take uh, pipes or um, other homemade objects to assemble and turn into a, a weapon as well. So of course that can be done, just as people can go to their shed, take some pipes, wood, uh, and make their own uh, make their own weapon. Uh, just as, but it's more common that people would probably either buy a gun or make a gun through other means. A three D printed plastic uh, gun, in my personal opinion, it's not very practical. Uh, I've never uh, seen how how it would work because of the mechanics of the heat. Uh, and how reusable it would be. Uh, but that that's, comes up sometimes that people will make a quick comment on that, uh, which what I've heard from other people in the 3D printing community, and they, it is a sore spot that they don't like it because any tool can be used for a weapon. So just as a hammer can be used as a weapon, 3D printing can be used as a weapon. Get it, thank you. Okay. No problem. So uh, it's a good good uh, transition point. So I'll go into the more uh, humanitarian uh, forensic science, which is also uh, it's uh, it's the application of the skills, expertise, and knowledge in forensics for humanitarian action. Uh, it's most often associated in situations of armed conflict, disasters. So it could be natural disasters, man-made. Uh, such such examples will be like an earthquake, a tsunami. Uh, or uh, man-made disaster, and such as like uh, more common would be uh, in recent years is um, uh, disasters in migration. For example, a sh ship sinks uh, in the Mediterranean or in the ocean, and we have uh, dozens or hundreds of people that die and go missing and and unidentified. And this is uh, another example where you have. Uh, Usually it's a large scale. So it's usually we have uh, very large scale complex recovery and identification processes uh, where um, there is a focus on the proper and dignified management to the dead, which is basically treating the dead in the ways that they should be treated. Uh, this, so for example, would be ensuring that at the search phase collection storage, that the bodies are treated with dignity, that they're treated properly and professionally so that they can be properly identified and uh, the families can be informed. Uh, it includes preventing and resolving the disappearance and missing. So a focus on the focus, main focus is on identification uh, less so on how the person died. So in a lot of these situations, whether it's even armed conflict or disasters, it's, uh, the priority is not so much on how the person died. In very many cases, we know how they died. The ship had sunk, they, they were drowned, or if it was an armed, go armed conflict that they were, it was during, let's say, a battle or a war, they were shot. Uh, it's focusing on, on, on how uh, that person can be identified and providing answers to the affected families or loved ones because in many of these situations, uh, families and loved ones, they, they do not know what happened. They don't know. Uh, one is that they, they, uh, they either might receive a body, for example, they might receive a body but are unsure if that is their loved one because of the process in which uh, the body was returned to them. They might be uh, questions of identity. Uh, this is quite common when you have many hundreds or thousands of, of dead. The bodies are decomposed, very difficult to identify, not always uh, can be or were identified by DNA, which people uh, more see as being more uh, 
reliable and more commonly used. Uh, so at this level, so and the humanitarian response often involves working with, in, particularly in forensics, working with the forensic practitioners and the institutions and the authorities that have the responsibility and the authorization. Uh, however, in these scenarios, which I mentioned above, which are either ongoing conflict, post-conflict, disasters, other large-scale situations, there's a need to strengthen and support that capacity because, because of a disaster at hit, uh, the authorities or the forensic practi practitioners don't have the capacity and infrastructure or resources to properly respond. In a uh, case going back, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, so you see like there's a tsunami where you have tens of thousands of people or millions of people that, that go missing and killed. The authorities are already weakened uh, at, you know, with electricity, water, health of the living. And at the same time, they're not uh, a normal mortuary structure it is not designed to handle such a large volume of cases. So this is kind of what I'm saying that humanitarian forensic science, this is kind of the, the sphere of the focus and the, the, the type of activities that, that we're mainly talking about. And as mentioned before, I, am, I work with the ICRC. I've been working for about seven years. And the ICRC is one humanitarian organization, the leading uh, organization in such situations of conflict violence. Uh, there's armed conflict, disasters, uh, migration. And in the ICRC, for example, uh, we've grown in the forensic unit. We have a forensic unit in the ICRC. Uh, approximately now we have about uh, for 90, I think over 90 forensic specialists, uh, including, uh, including in India as well. Uh, in which uh, it's really grown in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, and in each context or region, the ICRC provides the humanitarian response. And very often in these, in these places, there are a lot of the dead that go missing and the ICRC will work with the authorities, with families and, uh, and forensic practitioners to, to, better, uh, to better resolve, resolve these uh, situations of the dead. So uh, it's going back to my background is more in forensic anthropology and archeology, span uh, but however, it's a multidisciplinary approach in which it often requires expertise in forensic genetics, uh, odontology, pathology, uh, mortuary management as well. Uh, this is actually another field that people, it's, it's actually, it's a quite an important uh, thing. When I say mortuary management, it's because it's, many of these cases is just managing you know, a mortuary that would normally handle five or 20 cases a day would suddenly be in flood, in flooded with about 500 cases. And, and mortuary manage, proper mortuary management and uh, the capacity uh, is not prepared to handle this. And this is what, when, when cases can go missing, uh, bodies are returned uh, without a proper identification, families are unsure if that's their loved one and that's the correct body. So when we're saying multidisciplinary approach, it requires the expertise of many, many individuals, many different backgrounds. And so to go into more of some operational activities. So a lot of the work that ICRC uh, does do is, is uh, provide uh, equipment support. Uh, and when it comes to like say for forensics, it's forensic equipment that these places, they, they don't have available. At, available. Uh, sometimes that now they'll need additional training or guidance or expertise advice in a situation, so for it, so uh, for example, uh, for, as they're going back to forensic anthropology or also DNA, they might not have the uh, established DNA lab uh, ready to handle tens of thousands of cases, particularly for missing persons. And in many of these cases of the unidentified dead, it's their very decomposed, skeletonized, uh, fragmentary, commingled or mixed. And in these cases, this is what, where 
uh, forensic anthropology uh, is a is it more of an asset to supporting this multidisciplinary approach to the pathologist, to the mortuary managers, uh, to the forensic odontologist as well. So it's it's taking a, a lot of people on the team to really identify uh, these cases, and so this includes uh, training, providing uh, advice on uh, standard operating procedures, uh, recommendations for manuals, uh, and in some exceptional circumstances, substitution, in which due to, for example, and let's say in an armed conflict, uh, it's the authorities are not able to act because of access. Uh, so in these cases, uh, the ICRC can do a substitution in very, only in the exceptional cases that uh, the ICRC, which is a, uh, because it has more of a neutral, uh, can act as a neutral intermediary between, uh, between parties, uh, the ICRC can a bit, uh, act in a, in a professional manner to, to resolve specific cases. And this, this also involves engaging with uh, family members. I, I mentioned there previously how working with the families is, is really key. And in humanitarian forensics, it means communicating to the families uh, how the process works. It means uh, having dialogue with the families for collecting anti-mortem data. This is the, the information on how the person had died. Uh, so for example, that if someone had gone missing, whether it was uh, five days ago or sometimes 15 years ago, collecting information about how their loved one, uh, uh, um, information about their dental records, like, about their teeth, how did they have any tattoos, did they have any uh, injuries on their bones that maybe they can be identified, as well as collecting uh, DNA samples as well, collecting uh, uh, DNA from uh, close family members to assist in the identification process, uh, providing training to the experts in, in human identification for say post-mortem data. So to, one is to have the anti-mortem data and the post-mortem data, uh, working in first response as well. So a lot of first responders who are non-experts uh, to give them training on uh, and guidance on emergency response to the dead so that the, the bodies can be properly identified. So we have a lot of these levels on, on, on in different uh, disciplines as well. So it's incorporating depending on the situation or the context uh, involving the expertise of forensic anthropology, forensic archeology, span odontology, genetics, pathology, uh, and as well as mortuary management as well. And in giving through some of the scenarios that I said before, we, we're, we, we see common challenges. This is not just for humanitarian forensic science, but we see it particularly more because of the, the situation uh, that there is a lack of capacity mainly due to the disaster emergency. So we see a lack of resources and budget that uh, either the authorities, the forensic institutions, uh, they're already weakened by that, that disaster. So they don't have the budget available. They normally have a budget to handle only say 10 cases a day of dead bodies. And now suddenly they have 100 cases a day for several weeks or months. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the storage space. They don't have the equipment. They don't have the staff lack of uh, forensic equipment and materials. Uh, and, and going through this is where uh, I'll touch a bit more on the 3D printing is we have a lot of equipment that is not normally used in many countries or many uh, forensic institutions uh, because in, prior to the emergency, they didn't need, let's say, forensic anthropology equipment. They don't normally, in, uh, when I used to work in the United States, for example, uh, I would work in the Midwest where I would, uh, we would have uh, one uh, skeleton case, a human body, skeleton maybe once a year, uh, whether for a forensic case and uh, maybe two cases in a year in a population area of say one or one to three million people. So it's not very common. That, so therefore it's not integrated into many countries in forensic anthropology and human identification of skeletal remains. So this type of uh, Equipment is very uh, rare or hard to get uh, in many countries or contexts. There's also a lot of legal restrictions in which uh, there are hurdles to say that 
to strengthen the training or even the equipment as well. So I provided an example before about having a human skeletal collection. Uh, when I was in university and uh, uh, we would have a, a archeological collection, a collection of human remains uh, that, uh, or as well as some forensic cases might come up in which they were unidentified in which the students can learn uh, and practice their skills on uh, skeletonized remains. Many countries, this is not an option. It's, uh, it's, it's also too, and we're seeing now is also this change where the use of human remains now should, be, should not, maybe not be used for educational purposes or cannot be used. Also due to cultural reasons as well. There's some, it's more of a, um, some sort of restrictions. And also even to bring in or to find a new uh, skeletal collection is not easy to do. And of course, the travel access transport. So in many countries I worked in the past, it's extremely difficult to bring in uh, training material uh, or equipment. Uh, it takes a very long time. Uh, and uh, for some training scenarios, you need many, many uh, items for the training equipment. So if we're gonna donate one piece of uh, some, some device, like uh, in forensic anthropology, you might use osteometric boards or or calipers, uh, sliding calipers that are, uh, or plastic casts of uh, human of human remains for uh, identification training. Uh, they can be quite expensive or hard to get. Okay. And this 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 ties into how is the three D printing can uh, can provide support or to to uh, uh, be more useful or practical into humanitarian forensics because I, I touched on a few examples before where we have a human skeletal collection for comparative anatomy where it's quite difficult to get this. Uh, I, I had worked previously uh, in one context a, a few years ago where it was in the in, uh, South Caucasus where uh, we were trying to really strengthen the forensic anthropology, uh, skeletal uh, anatomy uh, in the pathologist lab where they would sometimes get uh, uh, bone cases and we would try to incorporate forensic anthropology training, now, which takes many years and it's a long process. And uh, there are no uh, good human skeletal collections available. The uh, only thing that you could have would be, say, an articulated plastic skeleton you might see in the doctor's office. And these were actually quite rare. However, it's quite uh, easier to, to, rather than waiting and shipping items that would take months, uh, very many months, and very expensive uh, to the, the country, we were able to just 3D print uh, some models uh, to complement the other uh, objects that were provided. So we would do, let's just say, uh, an articulated skeleton, as well as the disarticulated, which is the isolated bone elements of, uh, that's 3D printed. So we could give a, donate a articulated skeleton, but we can also provide a, the individual bones of you know, almost every bone on the body so that when they're presented with a disarticulated uh, element, they have something to compare to say, oh, I see that uh, this, uh, this is a cervical vertebra uh, of a human to compare it rather than something that's well connected. Another, another example would be uh, sensitization or interview sessions with family members where quite commonly uh, the ICRC or the authorities were working with family members to collect the antemortem data and which were, were interviewing them you know, re recording on forms and asking them about, about their, say their son or their brother on you know, what kind of teeth and it's a bit easier. And normally we would use these plaster casts from dentist office, which are quite expensive. However, using a 3D printed uh, plastic mandible is a bit uh, easier to ex add them, ask them to point on, on a 3D printed uh, uh, jaw. You know, where did they have a fracture on the tooth? Where did they have a uh, 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 gold tooth or uh, where did they lose a tooth? Something like this, where this is, uh, and here is, is an example, whereas I would use this more with the family members 
as opposed to a 3D printed one that is for another purpose, like which this is also 3D printed, which is the exact same mandible in a more uh, natural uh, white, uh, where I would not want to traumatize the family who recently lost a loved one. And they would think that that's an actual human. I'm not, obviously I'm not going to take a human uh, mandible just to ask the family member information about where on the body that, or where on the, on the mouth. I could also explain to the family members as well is by just simply taking a little like plastic skeleton and ex asking about like old fractures on the body uh, to see on how their loved one could be identified. So that's just a quick, a quick, uh, overview of how that can be used. Another one would be, another example was, which, uh, which I had done as well, was using uh, custom 3D printed objects, which uh, could be uh, the same thing that I presented before. So we could use a 3D printed, say, mandible in training uh, in scenarios and simulations in which, say, a recovery of a mass grave instead of using an articulated skeleton, which is in, attached on the wires. It's not very realistic as opposed to, uh, you can have many, many uh, different types of 3D printed uh, objects um, to show in a scenario, which is more realistic. On top of other objects that uh, are quite difficult to do, like for example, like a, even like a grenade, uh, something like this is quite, uh, you can be quickly 3D printed. However, shipping a fake grenade, uh, which is used from training is uh, very, very difficult to do because usually in uh, training it's metal uh, or a cast and uh, having it something shipped, it's gonna raise some flags. And uh, as opposed to if you're on the ground, you can just 3D print and they're quite, uh, can be done quite quickly. So these are just some, some examples. There's also other things like, when I say, this is what I say, weapon contamination. So what a lot of these scenarios, you might have situations of uh, maybe a 3D printed gun, but it's just more of the scenario of, of, of a situation which a gun is found with the body, not a functioning gun. Uh, other things can be that I uh, used in the past was also 3D bo printed body tags, in which these are just little plastic tags that, uh, uh, when a body is found that you're doing a scenario with a first responder in which they can uh, put onto the, the practice body. And by doing this, you can use uh, the tags that are for the local alphabets. Uh, so different countries. So like the ICRC might have uh, body tags that we use that are in a Latin alphabet, but not, not too applicable in some countries that they don't use a Latin alphabet when we say a number and a code system. So you can quickly... 3D print uh, other, some custom materials for the training and forensic, I did for say forensic archeology span where you have these crime scene uh, numbers or arrows, objects, which also do you, you can order online or we would order uh, for training or I could just 3D print the objects uh, locally rather than waiting several weeks or months. So it's not really replacing a lot of things. It's complementing the process. It's uh, one thing that I, I'd seen that from say 20 years ago, uh, digital cameras, we were, when I was working in the field 20 years ago, uh, digital cameras were still being not really fully integrated into forensics, uh, handheld GPS. Uh, I remember uh, uh, when I worked in uh, Kosovo about 20 years ago as well, we only had two or three handheld GPS units. Uh, and we'd never really had satellite imagery. We have, this is only something in the last uh, 15 years, which is more common now. Uh, these were not common. And of course, 3D printing would have never even heard of this. So 3D printing, it's, it's, it's now more commonly available. It's, it's a common technology, just like digital cameras that, uh, or the internet as well. But uh, so other things like 3D scanning, drones can, can provide a lot of support, particularly in when I say humanitarian for forensic activities, because we're not bringing uh, a replica into the court that someone can challenge, uh, but we can provide materials that are appropriate to experts, non-experts, uh, family members that can be, and can also be customized for the specific context or country. So it's, it's uh, to really to, uh, uh, and I, I see it as a way that, just to give you an example of some costs, 
uh, what some of the items that we're talking about are like uh, normally in forensic anthropology, some of the equipment can be quite expensive. Uh, uh, what's called, and there's a one piece of equipment is an osteometric board. It's a board that uh, measures the length of long bones used to estimate stature. And this object uh, item equipment in forensic anthropology can usually cost between two to two hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, which is just a simple device to to uh, measure a long bone. When you can three uh, D print three uh, D print uh, the parts to make your own, as well as uh, if you have a training session, you want to three uh, D print a lot of calipers because we have like five or ten participants, and we don't we can't necessarily buy. Uh, uh, buy or deliver uh, like um, normal digital calipers. So, it's, for example, you could have a digital caliper, which are not terribly expensive, but it'd be quite difficult to get, say, for one training session uh, or for a practice that to have something that's more uh, disposable uh, versus the one that's the normal professional equipment. So it's, it's just complementing the process of it. Uh, but I, I try to focus more at the, the bones. And uh, in the past three years, I, I did a kind of a test and tried to 3D print uh, pretty much almost every bone on the body. I don't have all of them here. Uh, so I would, uh, so even from the smallest ones, like a hyoid bone, which is this is the bone under your, under your chin, um, to, to the vertebra and as well as to the larger bones like a uh, pelvis. Male, this is uh, between either a male or a female. So you can quickly create some sort of a little simple training material. These are all, these are one third scale uh, or you can print at full, full scale as, as well. That they're quite, uh, not to, I'm not saying it's easy to do but it's quite getting quite more common. I don't know if you can see here. So to, to show an anatomy, you can quickly show a cross section of a human skull and the sinuses, the sinus structure, the teeth uh, for anatomy, for forensics on saying, is it a male, is it a female, is it an adult? These type of things in which uh, can really supplement the training and going back to the cost, the cost is a, extremely low and it's, it's quite, can be done quite quickly. Uh, small objects, um, for example, like uh, like this uh, mandible here, uh, would take say five to seven hours to print. Uh, uh, or I could do something more of a different uh, type, which is just a, this one, which takes like one or two hours. Uh, of course, a skull might take a say like a full day, but to just to print it and leave it overnight and then come back uh, the next day. And, and, and wait until it's done, rather than really waiting for literally months for the items to arrive. So uh, thank you very, very much for the time. Uh, I'll just include some of the references here um, and some of the online resources. Um, so I'll have some time for any questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. And uh, yes, we have uh, some questions from the participant. So I'm going to question, I'm going to take the question one by one. Uh, there is a first question. If a broken and highly damaged skull is found, 3D printing would be helpful to identify the person? Uh, it can be. Uh, there actually has been articles in which uh, fragmentary uh, skeletal remains are scanned. Mm -hmm. and then they can be uh, scanned into 3D, 3D printed, and then to assemble the 3D printed pieces uh, because of, let's say, that the fra fractured skull, uh, you're afraid that during the reconstruction or putting the skull bones together might be further damaged. This might more apply to, say, something that's has uh, not only just been fractured, but say exposed to the elements. And then taphonomy has taphonomic uh, processes such as um, it becomes very uh, fragile or in some situations as well as burnt. You can't really try to piece together. Uh, uh, normally, traditionally you use glue. So that is one way. Uh, it, 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 there is actually been some research studies on, on doing this process. So yes. Yes, thank you. 
second question we have if someone wants to get the training from where they can get the training on uh, 3d printing um uh, my training I, i i did it all through youtube pretty much <laughs> Uh, I, a lot of research. So on my, uh, I did it a lot on my personal time. Uh, on uh, there's a lot of the 3D printing of uh, objects. Uh, there's many, many, many on YouTube. If you uh, that are quite popular, and that's kind of how I first learned the engineering, the mechanics of it, about learning how the the device uses uh, temperature, uh, speed. Uh, and precision to make the objects and some of the things uh, that it requires a, a little bit of time, but uh, it's all there's plenty of online material for it uh, uh, available. Correct. Okay. Next question uh, I'm going to take: How much uh, is it useful for a forensic odontology if they use 3D printing for analysis? For 3D printing for. Uh, 3D printing for analysis, but you know 3D printing analysis. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So for the teeth, uh, maybe Dr. Puya might want to come in. But for the teeth, when I, as I've been uh, doing the examples, is showing uh, examples more the training level of like uh, explaining the differences in uh, anti mortem loss, post mortem loss, to show an examples of uh, if they don't have in a collection. Pathology, uh, disease, or trauma into it. I, I, in my scope, uh, background is more at the training level. Uh, that because you're going to lose a lot of the precision uh, in the printing part when you have small micro fractures or very small things. So if there's small features in, especially in teeth, where you're talking about uh, small fractures that are uh, can only be seen on X-ray, for example, radiographs. Uh, or that the the cracks or the features might have uh, tens of microns or less. So in this type of FDM uh, 3D printing, it's just at the general macro level at the what's missing, what's present, and maybe uh, features of a male versus a female, different ethnic backgrounds perhaps or um, ancestry. Um, and but uh, but for 3D scanning it through a CT scan or a laser scanner can be quite useful to to see the trauma. Uh, in teeth or smaller, smaller bones as well. Okay. Uh, next question: To what extent can a completely bond skull can, a skull can be identified with the help of three D printing? That goes back to the previous question, where if it was a burnt skull uh, that is uh, um, fragment fractures, because when a um, bone is subjected to high uh, temperature. The, the shape might adjust. Of course, it will fracture, uh, particularly in some uh, parts like the teeth will actually uh, might explode uh, due to the heat. Uh, and that there uh, is going back to the previous answer is that some when you have a lot of fragmentary material that it's quite difficult to to handle. It could be scanned. Each bone could be or bone fragment could be scanned in 3D uh, with, your, with a laser scanner or uh, very carefully. Or with a CT scanner, I think that a, a laser scanner uh, might be a bit better to do it, and then then you can manipulate it in 3D. So more of the 3D modeling. This goes back to because I kind of jumped over the 3D model, where a lot can be done in software in 3D, the digital level. And of course, you could 3D print some pieces that you want to kind of uh, glue glue or associate together. But this can also be done uh, virtually in the digital at the digital level too. You can reconstruct it and then print it out. See how it looks. Yeah. Continuing further to this question, uh, can the three D printed model can be manipulated? Or something? yes. So you can. Uh, yeah. Yes. So you can. Uh, it can be man manipulated, just like say photos can be man manipulated. So if I wanted to to. Uh, To uh, I think I might have an example of uh, so you can make it a bigger or smaller. I think I have a an example. Ah, here we go. So here is a an example of a mandible. Uh, here is the full size replica of a female mandible, uh, one to one. 
And then here is the same mandible at about uh, 50%. So I can resize it, make it smaller, make it bigger, make changes to it, just as in Photoshop. So of course, for uh, say if it was for court purposes, uh, anyone could say that was that file or image uh, doctored or adjusted or edited. So yes, you can edit it as well as additional software to make a different, uh, different, thing, different things. I actually did experimenting on that by adding like say additional teeth or other types of, to recreate a pathology or a trauma can be done as well. So uh, will this, uh, such kind of evidences admissible in court of law? That uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, certain of. I'm sure that will change by every country. Um, my uh, my background in the last seven years is more the humanitarian forensics, where uh, we do not engage the court evidence. Uh, court evidence, but there is uh, examples, I believe, in the UK uh, about that the replicas were presented in the courtroom setting. So, in one of the references, I think in the, the last page. Um, um, uh, by uh, the overview of 3D printing and forensic science does have a case example of that by uh, uh, the author, Rachel Carew. She uh, has a, a many publications on as examples on that. I must say it's a very interesting lecture and uh, all the participants have learned a lot and they got the insight about the 3D printing, how they can use the 3D printing and what are the things. I once again thank you, Matthew, for uh, spending, spending your time and sparing your time for taking out the, uh, this lecture. Although we are in the virtual space, I request you to accept the certificate for delivering such a wonderful talk from the organizer from the Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Thank you so much, my, uh, Matthew. And uh, with this, uh, I thank you all the my dedicated team member, those who has reached to the several uh, platform and uh, connected more and more people so that uh, many uh, participants had benefited by such a wonderful lecture. And they uh, get the good idea about how the 3D printing can be used in the humanitarian forensic and what are the things, what are the limitations and what are the other things we can learn and what are the development opportunity we have in this things. So thank you all my dedicated team members, those who are reaching to the several people. Again, as uh, we are going to have the, another lecture on 15th November and uh, moderator will be Dr. Anita Jasuja for the same lecture. And that topic will going to the detecting uh, and investigating firearm incidents. With this, uh, I request my team member also to accept the certificate. Uh, for reaching out to several platform and giving the uh, idea about that particular lecture so that more and more people can learn about the things. So I thank you all the, my team member and uh, for uh, their honest uh, dedication to reaching more and more people. With this, uh, uh, I like to announce more things because we are going to in September organize a big event and that big event will be coming in a Mumbai and that will be a national uh, 19th national conference of the Indian Association of Forensic Odontology and the first biannual symposium of Association of Forensic Odontology for Human Rights. The date has announced and date will be 20, 24, 25th, 26th, September 2020. If everything will be a normal without any hurdle in the COVID, these uh, registration details are already uh, displayed and uh, you all can note down this registration detail and register. You can get this registration detail in our WhatsApp group also. With this, I would like to thank you, uh, Matthew, once again, and I request my uh, co-host, Dr. Pooja, to uh, give the closing remark. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being here. You know, it was such a crisp presentation, I must say. We just got so many takeaway points from where we can actually start thinking about a new dimension of 3D printing and even humanitarian forensics. There were so many things that I'm sure many of our participants have taken down note of. And it was at such a short notice that you were informed to come with us. And I'm really thankful that you accepted and you came with us. Thank you so much. It was totally our pleasure to host you here. Thank you again. It was really my honor. It was really good. Uh... Thank you for having me and uh, good luck on, uh, on, 
on everything for the uh, upcoming uh, presentations and conferences.